3543 18th Street, Suite 8 in San Francisco, where tickets will be sold at the door. This event is sponsored by KPFA and is part of a week of events celebrating the year 1968. For more information, go to insurrection68.org. And you are listening to KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, or online anywhere in the world at www.kpfa.org. I'm Brian Edwards Teekert, and as we move through our fall fundraising marathon, we're bringing you a special for the next hour, focused on one of the signature voices from KPFA's early years, Alan Watts. Alan Watts' gift for startling audiences into deeper levels of insight made him the West's most celebrated ambassador of Eastern spirituality during his times. He hosted a program here on KPFA from 1953 until his death in 1973. This compilation from our Alan Watts audio archives is one of his most engaging and profound seminars entitled, Do You Do It or Does It Do You? How to Let the Universe Mediate You. It brings his trademark eloquence and mischievous insight to the possibility that we may be much more than who we think we are. And if you'd like to get a copy of it on a four-CD set, just call our pledge room, 1-800-439-5732. Without further ado, Alan Watts. I wonder if it's ever struck you how curious a thing it is that most of the things that we experience we regard as things that happen to us which we ourselves do not originate which are events expressing some sort of power or activity that is external to ourselves and if you consider that you realize that what you mean by yourself is rather narrowly circumscribed Even events that go on in our own bodies are put in the category of things that happen to us in the same way as things that go on in the world outside our skins. If there's a thunderstorm or an earthquake, well, it happens to you. You're not responsible for it. But so in the same way, when you have hiccups, you didn't plan on it. If you have belly rumbles, you had no intention of doing it. And... As to the catastrophic act of getting born, well, you had nothing to do with that. And you can spend all your life blaming your parents for putting you in the situation in which you find yourself. And this uh, way of looking at the world in this sort of passive mood as something that happens to you goes right down to our general feeling about life. It goes down to the way in which As Westerners, we have been accustomed to look at human existence as a precarious event in a cosmos that, uh, on the whole, is depicted as being completely unsympathetic and alien to our existence. In other words, if you're reared with a 20th century, or shall we say an early 20th century common sense, which is based on the philosophy of science of the 19th century, with its rejection of Christianity and Judaism, you regard yourself as an accident, a biological accident, in a stupid universe, which is mechanical, but has no feelings, no finer feelings. A vast, pointless gyration of radioactive rocks and gas in which you happen to occur. Of course, if you don't have that point of view and you are more traditional, you look upon yourself as a child of God. And therefore under authority. In other words, there's a big boss on top of all this who allowed you at his pleasure to deign to have the disgusting effrontery to exist. And uh, you better watch your P's and Q's because that Almighty is looking after you. 
with the attitude of this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And uh, when you look at the world in that image, or in the other image, that it's a stupid mechanism, either point of view you take, you don't really belong. You are not really part of all this. And I could use a stronger word than part, only we don't have it in English. We have to say something like, um, connected with it, essential to it. Or to put it in the strongest possible way, it is quite alien to Western thought to conceive that the external world, which is defined as something that happens to you, and your body itself as something that you got caught up with, it is quite alien to our thought to consider all that as you yourself. Because, you see, we have such a myopic view of what one's self is. It's as if, in other words, we selected how much experience is really to be regarded as me. As if you focused your attention on certain restricted areas of the whole panorama of things that you experience and say, I will take sides with that much of it. Now, we come here right at the start to an extremely important principle, which is the different points of view you get when you change your level of magnification. That is to say, you can look at something with a microscope and see it a certain way. You can look at it with a naked eye and see it in a certain way. You look at it with a telescope and you see it in another way. Now, which level of magnification is the correct one? Well, obviously, they're all correct, but they're just different points of view. You can, for example, look at a newspaper photograph under a magnifying glass, and where with the naked eye you will see a human face, with the magnifying glass you will just see a profusion of dots, rather meaninglessly scattered. But as you stand away from that connection of dots, which all seem to be separate and apart from each other, they suddenly arrange themselves into a pattern. And you see that these individual dots add up to some kind of sense. Now you'll see at once from this illustration that maybe you, when you take a myopic view of yourself, as most of us do, but you may add up to some kind of sense that is not apparent to you in your ordinary consciousness. When we examine our bloodstreams, under a microscope, we see there's one hell of a fight going on. All sorts of microorganisms are chewing each other up. And if we got it overly fascinated with our view of our own bloodstreams in the microscope, we should start taking sides. <laughs> which would be fatal. Because the health of our organism depends on the continuance of this battle. What is, in other words, conflict at one level of magnification is harmony at a higher level. And could it possibly be, therefore, that we, with all our problems, conflicts, neuroses, sicknesses, political outrages, wars, tortures, and everything that goes on in human life, are a state of conflict which can be seen in a larger perspective as a situation of harmony? Well, it is claimed, you see, that some human beings have broken through to that vision, that they've slipped somehow or other into states of consciousness where they see the apparent disintegration and disorganization of everyday life as the functioning of a totality which at its level is completely harmonious. And you can say, aha, at last I see, I got the point. I've seen how all this makes sense. But what this insight depended upon was your overcoming the illusion that space separates things. That is to say, the space, the interval between your body and mine, the interval created by 
birth at one end and death at the other. And then after somebody's death, then somebody else's birth. These are events with intervals between them. And normally we regard these intervals in time and these intervals in space as having no importance, no function. <coughs> we tend to see the universe itself as really consisting in all the stars and galaxies. That's what it is. That's what we notice. But the space in which all this happens is sort of written off as something that isn't really there. But what one has to realize is that the space is an essential function of the things in the space. After all, you can't have separate stars unless there is a space around them. E eliminate the space and you will see you couldn't have this phenomenon at all. And vice versa. You couldn't have the space. They wouldn't be there in any sense whatsoever if there weren't the bodies in it. So the bodies in the space and the space are two aspects of a single continuum. They're related together in exactly the same way as a back and a front. And you just don't get one without the other. So the moment you see that intervals, that space is connective, you can understand at once how you are not just to be exclusively defined as a flash of consciousness that occurs between two eternal darknesses, which is the popular common sense view which Western man has of his own life. That you consider that in the darkness that comes before your birth, there was no you, and in the eternal darkness that follows your death, there is likewise no you. And I'm going to discuss these matters, not by appealing to any special spooky knowledge, as if I had been traveling on the higher planes and knew all my previous incarnations and therefore could tell you authoritatively that uh, you are much more than this individuality. I'm going to do it on a basis of complete common sense, that everybody has access to the facts. And that just what you have to realize is that uh, life is a pattern of immense complexity. And what you call yourself as a living organism, say, I am my whole body at the very least. Now, what is that body? That body is recognizable, and I recognize my friends when I meet them again with luck, and you recognize me. Although the last time any of you saw me, I was absolutely something entirely different from what I am now. Just as the flame of a candle is never a constant. A flame of a candle is a stream of hot gas. Only you say the flame of the candle as if it were a constant. Well, it is a recognizably constant pattern. The spear-shaped outline of the flame and its coloration is a constant pattern. But in exactly the same way, we are all constant patterns. And that's all we are. The only thing constant about us at all is the doing rather than the being. It's the way we behave, the way we dance. Only there's no we that dances. There's just the dancing. Just as the flame is the streaming of hot gas. Just as a whirlpool in a river is a whirling of streaming water. There is no thing that whirlpools there is the whirlpool and in the same way each one of us is a very very delightfully complex undulation of the energy of the whole universe only by our process of miseducation we've been deprived of the knowledge of that fact uh, not as if uh, there was someone to blame for this because it's always with our own tacit consent because life is basically a game of hide-and-seek. Because life is pulsation. On and off. Here it is, and now it isn't. And by being this pulsation, we know it's there. See, uh, you, you, you don't know what you mean by on unless you know what you mean by off. 
That's why when we want to awaken someone, we knock at the door. It's not enough to slam the door once with your fist and make a big noise, but you keep up a pulsation because that by its on and offness attracts attention. Uh, all life, you see, is this flickering in and out. Only there are enormous rhythms in it. There are very fast flickering ins and outs, like the reaction of light upon our eyes, such that if I take a lighted cigarette in the dark and I spin it, you will see a circle of fire. Because the reflection of that cigarette tip on your retina lasts, it endures, just in the same way as on a radar screen. An image stays a little while until it's revivified by another round. So in that way, you see, you notice continuity. And in the same way, then, you notice the continuity of a light, because although, like, say, with an arc lamp, an arc lamp is actually a flickering light. And that's why they don't allow arc lights to be used in any shop where there's a circular saw moving. Because sometimes the flickering speed of the arc light so synchronizes with the turning speed of the teeth on the blade that the teeth look as if they're not moving. And so anybody who might put his hand on the blade would have it chopped off thinking it was a still one. So in this way, very fast impulses are looked upon as constant. And we see where there are fast impulses, a solid thing. When you look at the blade of a propeller or an electric fan, the separated four or three blades become a solid disc and you cannot throw an egg through it. Well, so in exactly the same way, you can't put your finger through a rock because the rock is moving too fast for your finger to go through. That's the meaning of the, of the whole phenomenon of hardness. Hardness in nature is immense energy. But acting in a very concentrated space, restricted space, but going to beat hell. That's why you can't get through it. Now, from those very tiny fast rhythms, which give us the impression of continuity, there are also in this universe immensely slow rhythms. And these are very difficult for us to keep track of. And they impress us and depress us as our own life and death, as our coming and going, which goes for what is to us such a slow pace that we can't possibly believe that it is really a rhythm. We think of it as our birth, as something quite unique that could never occur again because we're so close to it, you see, and it's moving so slowly. And so, with that point of view, we are, like uh, Marshall McLuhan has said, he borrowed a metaphor from me, which is that we are driving a car looking at the rear vision mirror. That means that the environment in which you believe yourself to exist is always a past one. It isn't the one you're actually in. The process of growth, the, the basic process of biology is one in which lower orders are always being superseded by higher orders. But the lower order can never figure out, or only very rarely figure out, what the higher order is that's taking over. And may see it as a terrible threat, as total disaster, as the very end. But therefore can never be aware that the principle of growth always has and always will continue. Whereas that's what's going on. But you never know what the next step is going to be. Because if you did know, you wouldn't take it. Because it would already be past. Do you understand this? That any certainly known future is an event of which we can say you've had it. And in that sense it's past. When we play a games, and we uh, say in chess or in a bridge or whatever game you're playing, the outcome of the game becomes certain, we at that point cancel the game and begin a new one. Because the whole zest of the thing, and which takes me back to the idea that this whole thing is a hide-and-seek game, is that you don't know what the next order coming up is. But one thing you can be sure of, it will be an order. And it will comprehend you. At the moment, we stand at a time in history where we're beginning to think of the great countdown on the end of the human race. Terrifying possibility. 
that through atomic energy, we may obliterate this planet and uh, turn the whole globe into a star. Maybe that's the way all the stars started. Imagine, you know, this great thing coming up. The countdown on the end. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Where have you heard that before? You sit on the seashore and you hear the waves going in and out and you don't stop to think. That's what you're doing. That's what the whole business is doing. And there are places where the wave mounts and mounts and it gets too big for its boots or whatever and it spills and breaks. We could do just that. But... Uh, very important to realize that that's what you're doing because then you don't get panicky about it. And the person who's going to press that button is the person who's going to be in panic. So if you realize that that's what it is and that uh, it doesn't really matter if the whole human race blows itself up, then there's a chance that it won't do it. That's the only chance we have. Not to do this thing which attracts us like a kind of vertigo, like a person who looks over a precipice and is all set to throw himself over. Or a person who jumps out of a plane when they're skydiving and forgets to pull the parachute ring because he gets fascinated with a target. It's called target fascination. He just goes straight at it, you see. So we can get absolutely fascinated with disaster, with doom. Or, you know, all the news in the newspapers is invariably bad news. There is no good news in the newspapers. People wouldn't buy a newspaper consisting of good news. Even the free press is full of terrible news. <laughs> Except the San Francisco Oracle. <coughs> and uh, the fascination, you see, for this doom might be neutralized if we would say, well... Why bother about that? It's just a, another fluctuation in this huge, marvelous, endless chain of our own selves and our own energy going on. You're listening to Alan Watts from his meditation lecture, Do You Do It or Does It Do You? How to Let the Universe Meditate You. We're going to be bringing you more Alan Watts in just a few seconds, but we do want to let you know what you're listening to. Uh, this meditation lecture is available on a four-CD set, including a rare guided meditation session with Alan Watts for a pledge of just $100 in the KPFA phone room right now at 1-800-439-5732. Alan Watts was many things. He was an editor at one time, an Anglican priest, a graduate dean, an author, a lecturer, an entertainer, and for 20 years here on KPFA, starting in 1953, a broadcaster with a weekly show that pushed the bounds of the possible for a lot of people living in the Bay Area during that period. We're very pleased to have the archival material to bring his voice into the 21st century where it still seems so relevant today. And as we're doing it, we're also trying to raise the money to keep this radio station on the air for voices like Alan Watts's that go against the grain that bring new ideas into our limited lives. And if you appreciate that, we're asking for your pledge of support at 1-800-439-5732. Again, the lecture you've just been listening to on four CDs along with a guided meditation session available for a pledge of $100 at 1-800-439-5732. If you can pledge $300, we can give you the 12 CD set of Alan Watts's lectures and programs. Alan Watts, out of your mind, 12 CDs of material for $300 at one 800 Four three nine five seven three two. I'm Brian Edwards Teekert. We're going to be heading right back into Alan Watts. That number one last time. If you want to make a pledge, one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. See, here's the problem. 
because of our myopia, because of our, the way we've, as it were, restricted consciousness to focus upon just that certain little area of experience that we call voluntary action. That's us. And everything else happens to us. Now, that's obviously absurd. Let's suppose you take in your hand one of those toys, a, a gyroscopic top. And you suddenly notice, the minute you get this in your hand, that it has a kind of vitality to it. It seems to resist you. It starts pushing you in a certain way, see? And sometimes you're with it and following it. And then sometimes you see it, it's just as if you held a living animal in your hand. You know, you pick up a, a uh, hamster, you know, or a guinea pig, and you hold this little thing in your hand, it's always trying to escape. So the gyroscope always seems to be trying to escape your hold. Now, in exactly the same way, what you're experiencing all the time, all sorts of things are getting out of control and doing things you don't expect. It's trying to escape your hold. All right, then don't grab it so hard. And you discover that this living thing that you're feeling, like the gyroscope top, it's your own life. Because you can see very simply that you would not understand the experience that you call voluntary action and decision, being in control and being in yourself, unless in opposition to that there was something else. You couldn't realize self and control and will unless there was something other, out of control, and instead of will, won't. It's the two together only that produces the sensation that you call having a personal identity. Only, there is a funny thing about human consciousness which has been worked out very carefully in Gestalt psychology, which is that our attention is captured by the figure rather than the background, by the relatively enclosed area rather than the diffuse area, and by something moving rather than what is relatively still and to all those phenomena that in this way attract our attention, we attribute a higher degree of reality than the ones we don't notice. That's only because, for the moment, those are more important to us. Consciousness, you see, is a radar that is scanning the environment to look out for trouble, just in the same way as a ship's radar is looking for rocks or other ships. And the radar, therefore, does not notice the vast areas of space where there are no rocks, no other ships. So, in the same way, our eyes, or rather the selective consciousness behind the eyes, only pays attention to what we think is important. I am at this moment aware of all of you in this room, of every single detail of your clothing, of your faces, and so on, but I'm not noticing it all. And therefore, I will not be able to remember tomorrow exactly how each one of you looked and what you were wearing. Because what I notice is restricted to things that I think are particularly important. If I notice some particularly beautiful girl in the audience, then I might notice also what she's wearing. And uh, that would be memorable. But by and large, you see, we scan things over, but we pay attention only to what our set of values tells us we ought to pay attention to. And so in this way, we have this uh, rather myopic way of looking at things. And we screen out from attention anything that is not immediately important to a scanning system based on sensing danger. But quite obviously, you as a complete individual are much more than the scanning system. You are in relationships with the external world that on the whole are incredibly harmonious. Going back to this illustration of every living body as something like the flame of a candle. The energies of life in the form of temperature, light, air and food and so on are streaming through you all at this moment in the most magnificently harmonious way. 
And you're, f all of you, far more beautiful than any candle flame. Just sitting in these chairs, just going, you know. Only we are so used to it. We say about that, so what? Show me something interesting. Show me something new. Because it's a characteristic of consciousness that it ignores stimuli that are constant. When anything is constant, it says, okay, that's safe. It's in the bag. Needn't pay attention to that anymore. And therefore, we eliminate systematically from our awareness all the gorgeous things that are going on all the time and instead only become focused on the things, the troublesome things that might happen to upset it. Which is all right, but we make too much of it. And become, we make so much of it that we identify our very selves, I, ego, with the radar, with the troubleshooter. And that's only a tiny fragment of one's total being. So that if you do become aware that you are not simply that scanning mechanism, but you are your complete organism, then very swiftly, in turn, as a consequence of that, you become aware that your organism is not the way you think about it when you look at it from the standpoint of conscious attention, from the standpoint of the ego. From the standpoint of the ego, your organism is uh, your kind of vehicle, your automobile, in which you go around. But from a physical point of view, your organism is again like the candle flame or the whirlpool. It is something which is a continuous patterning or activity of the whole cosmos. The key idea here is pattern. Let's suppose uh, I'm going to borrow a metaphor from Buckminster Fuller. Suppose we have a rope. And the one section of this rope is made of uh, manila hemp. The next section is cotton. The next section is silk. The next section is nylon, and so on. Now, we tie a knot in this rope. Just an ordinary one-over knot. And you find by putting your finger in the knot, you can move it all the way down the rope. Now, as this knot travels, it's first of all made of manila hemp, it's then made of cotton, it's then made of silk, it's then made of nylon, and so on. But the knot keeps going on. And that's the integrity of pattern, the continuing pattern, which is what you are. Because you might, you know, be for several years you might be a vegetarian, and you might be a meat eater, and uh, so on, and you know your constitution changes all the time, but people, your friends still recognize you, because you're still putting on the same show. It's the same pattern. That is, the recognizable individual. But we are trained in our language. The very structure of the language we talk deceives us into misunderstanding this. Because when we see a pattern, we ask, what's it made of? Like you see a table. Is it made of wood or is it made of aluminum? But then when you inquire into what is wood, and how does wood differ from aluminum, the only thing a scientist can tell you is the different patterns. That is to say, the different molecular structure of two things. And a molecular structure is not a description of what something is made of. It is a description of what dance it is performing. What motions, what kind of a symphony this is. Because basically, all phenomena of life are musical. And uh, gold differs from lead in exactly the same way that a waltz differs from a mazurka. It's a different dance. And there isn't anything that's dancing. That is a deception we get into because we have two parts of speech in our grammar. We have nouns and verbs. And verbs are supposed to describe the activities of nouns. And this is simply a convention of speech. You could have a language with only verbs in it. You don't need any nouns, or you could also have a language with the nouns only and no verbs. And uh, it would perfectly adequately describe what's going on in the world. So if you were used to speaking with a, part, with a language that had one part of speech, you could say just as much as we can.
was two and be a lot clearer. Only at first it would sound awkward, but you'd soon get used to it. And then when you got used to it, it would be a matter of common sense that the patterning of the world is not some kind of stuff that's patterning. You don't have to seek for a substance underlying the whole thing. It's just patterning. And we're all that. And so in this way, there is, to a person who really wakes up, you very soon realize that your existence is not something that is just uh, the uh, hopeless little creature that's suddenly confronted with a great big external world that goes Gah! at him, you know, and eats him up. Every tiniest little thing that comes into being, every minute little fruit fly or gnat or bacterium, I will go so far as to say is an event upon which this whole cosmos depends. This thing goes both ways. It's not only that every little organism which exists depends on its total environment. The reverse is also true that the total environment depends on each and every one of those little organisms. So that you could say this universe consists of a, an arrangement of pattern in which every event is essential to the whole thing. Now, we screen that idea out of our consciousness in exactly the same way that we screen out the perception of space as an important reality. Just as we pay attention to the figure and ignore the background, so we see one way of looking at things, mainly that the organism is very frail against the environment. It lasts a long time, the environment, but the organism only lasts a short time. What do you mean the environment lasts a long time? What does the environment consist of? Just a lot of little things. And yet there is the environment just as the same way as there is the face in the newspaper photograph behind all those little dots. When you get far enough away from it, you see the face. When you get far enough away from all the organisms and the little bits of things, you see the environment. In another scale of magnification. But actually, uh, the whole thing is arranged in a, a polar system where the enormous depends on the tiny and the tiny depends on the enormous. And you get a relationship between these extremes which can be called a transaction. That is to say, a transaction when there's buying and selling it's impossible to have buying without selling and selling without buying. So you, you always, wherever you are looking at the general panorama of sensory experience, try switching. Try shifting your attention to all the things you thought were unimportant, to the constants, to the background. And begin looking at the spaces between people. Uh, all painters have to learn this. Because especially if you're working in oils, you actually have to paint in the background. Weavers know this. Because when they're making patterns in weaving, they've got to weave the background as well. Or if you do needlepoint with embroidery, think of the hours you spend putting in the background over the canvas in wool. And you become aware of it. Same way the people who made the, the great oriental carpets. They're much more aware of the background as constituting an essential part of the total experience. So, as you become aware of this, you will see the same thing that you notice in music. Namely, that it is only as a result of hearing the interval between tones that you hear any melody. If you don't hear the interval, you're tone deaf. And all notes are the same noise. All you hear is rhythm. You don't hear any melody. You've got to hear the interval. So then watch the intervals between people. The things that aren't said. The things that are tacit. The things that are implicit rather than explicit in all life. And then you begin to get connected. You know, it's very important to have a connection in life. And um, to be in the know. 
And uh, this is the way it, it, it fundamentally comes out of seeing the thing you forgot. You know, you can always bug people in a beautiful way, in a very helpful way, by just saying to them, what did you forget? I say, well, I don't know. Uh, what was I supposed to remember? Oh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm really not trying to put you on. I, I mean, it's not difficult. This is something completely obvious that you forgot. You, you'd easily remember it because it's so obvious. Well, that's the hardest thing in the world to think of. What's the most obvious thing I forgot? Oh, what's that? Well, who do you think you are? Well, how do you answer that question? Who are you? Well, you give a name. You say, I'm Joe Dokes, I'm Alan Watts. That's not true. That's what people told you you were. They put that name on you and they taught you to identify with it and to behave as it was expected to behave. But that's not who you are. You know very well. Go back in your memory. Go back into your infancy before they started telling you all this stuff. Who are you? And if you get with that, you'll know uh, very well who you are. The jolly old ancient of days. Only there's a conspiracy that you mustn't let on about that. Because everybody is. And uh, if one person realizes it, the other's a little bit offended. And they say, well, uh, how come you're so great? We worked it in Christianity by a very clever thing of allowing just one individual to be recognized as the God incarnate. And uh, nobody else, therefore, could be. And since he had been safely crucified and whisked up to heaven, he wouldn't bother us anymore. So everybody, therefore, who gets an intimation of who they really are and ever comes out with it in Christian civilization, people say, who the hell do you think you are? Are you Jesus Christ? Well, you can say Jesus Christ said he was Jesus Christ and everybody put him down for it and that's what you're doing to me. Oh, they say, forget that one. Because uh, it's like uh, somebody comes out and composes some perfectly terrible music. And the critics say, this man is a cacophonist. He is completely incompetent. And he said, did you re read the reviews of Beethoven's first symphony when it was performed at Vienna? Now, the thing is... <laughs> We allowed one person, you see, one human individual, to be the incarnate God. Because we have all been living in a theory of the universe in which the individual is simply involved in something that happens to him. The voice, the voice of Alan Watts. Alan Watts was one of the signature programmers of KPFA's early years. He came on the airwaves here starting in 1953 and continued broadcasting until his death some 20 years later. He brought to KPFA's listeners during a time of an increasingly narrow political and spiritual discourse in this country, a fusion of various traditions in Eastern philosophy and spirituality with some of the things he'd picked up along the way as at various times, a graduate student, a graduate dean, an Anglican priest, and an avid pursuer of things like cooking, chanting, dancing, and hiking. His voice is one of those that we have preserved in KPFA's archives and is really part of the history of this nation because he's tied up with many of the movements of his time out of the Bay Area, the beatnik literary movement, the politics that started bowling up in the cauldron of San Francisco, and he's one of the voices we would like to offer you as part of our fall fund drive so that you can vote in support of the work that KPFA has been doing for the past 59 years and make sure we're around to do it for 59 more. The lecture you are listening to is The Universe. Do you do it or does it do you? 
It spreads over four CDs and includes a rare guided meditation session with Alan Watts. It's yours for a pledge of $100 or more at 1-800-439-5732. We also have a 12-CD Alan Watts set entitled Out of Your Mind. 12 CDs worth of broadcasts and lectures that Alan Watts gave during his lifetime. It's yours for $300 or more in the pledge room at 1-800-439-5732. And of course, the most important thing you get with a pledge of any amount is our continued ability to bring you voices like Alan Watts and the people doing contemporary analogs of his work today here at 94.1 FM. If you value the insight and inspiration that you get here, if you appreciate the independent news and critical analysis, if you like having arts, culture, and independent music unformatted all under one roof, then we're asking for you to support in grassroots media by being part of making it possible by picking up that phone and calling 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-HEY-KPFA. I'm Brian edwards Teekert from the KPFA News Department uh, down here in KPFA's main studio with Jim Bennett. Jim. Yes. <laughs> nice to see you down here. It's also great to hear Alan Watts again. When I first started working for KPFA in Pacifica in the early 1980s, and my uh, show that I do now on Saturdays uh, started to air, it aired on Sunday afternoons, and it was followed by reruns of Alan Watts's program for KPFA. And uh, it was so great to hear this very powerful a voice that uh, was uh, so much a part and actually still is of KPFA and uh, one of the many, as you said, Brian, signature voices uh, that Pacifica can be very proud of uh, for what he has brought to our airwaves and thought and deed and uh, in voice and uh, certainly the eloquence, the, the lyricism of his voice, the insights that he gave us and also his great sense of humor. There was no one like him, and he really does uh, live on through uh, these lectures and uh, sessions that uh, we are making available. And uh, what he talks about certainly is very timely and very timeless. It doesn't go away, does it? It does not. It's still uh, quite powerful and so necessary to uh, be able to, to hear someone like Alan Watts. And we'd urge you to get this four CD set for a $100 pledge to KPFA and then maybe donate it to a school or a library or share it with a group of friends. But uh, let them know about Alan Watts. Let them know about KPFA and let them know that they can support KPFA uh, at any time by pledging online at kpfa.org or by giving us a call at 1-800-439-5732. If you consider KPFA to be a valuable resource for the voices that you hear on our airwaves and seldom anywhere else, and the list is long, then we're asking you to give back a little bit today, $8.33 a month for this four CD sets of Do You Do It or Does It Do You from Alan Watts, available to you right now. And we also have the 12 CD Alan Watts Out of Your Mind set for a $300 pledge. And we'll actually dedicate that to Brian. He out of my out, mind? Out of his mind. That's the uh, Brian out of your mind set. 1-800-439-5732 or locally 510-848-5732. Jim Allen Watts is kind of one of these figures who's right in the middle of history. Uh, doing events with Allen Ginsberg and Timothy Leary and the poet Gary Snyder who's kind of straddling two worlds as he goes to places like India and Japan to learn the traditions there and then bring them back and try to translate them to a Western audience. He's kind of at the forefront of something historic, but when you listen to him, it sounds so contemporary. He talks about the problems and conundrums that plague us just as much today, what it means to have space and time compressed by modern travel and communications so that you can go to Tokyo and find pretty much the same things you'd find in Dallas. If you would like to take home some of his insights, we encourage you to pick up this 4 CD set. Alan Watts, do you do it or does it do you? Yours for a pledge of $100 or more. Or if you can spring for the 12 CD set, the Alan Watts Out of Your Mind set, that is $300 or more. And you can do that in monthly installments if you want to break it up into smaller payments. The most important thing you do, though, pick up that phone, give us a call. Tell us you support KPFA, you support a place where you could hear the voice of Alan Watts when he was alive, and you can still hear the best of Alan Watts years after he passed when it still has so much to teach us. 1-800-439-5732.
I want to thank Jay Siegel of Menlo Park for pledging online, actually taking out an additional donation online. Thank you very much, Jay Siegel from Menlo Park. Uh, maybe you want to join him by pledging online and also picking up the Alan Watts box set that we're offering of four CDs. Do you do it or does it do you for a $100 pledge to KPFA? We've got four people on the line right now. I think we can get a few more of you over to your phones to fill up the lines that we have available right now. So it is a good time to get through. It's also a great time to support KPFA. This is the first full week of our KPFA Fall Fun Drive. We started just last Thursday. We've got a long way to go, and we'll get there with your help and also with the, the great voice and work of Alan Watts contained uh, in this 4-CD set or the 12-CD set. Uh, maybe you'll want to get both of them. Uh, you can do that. We're playing audio today from the 4-CD set, Do You Do It or Does It Do You? There's much, much more, obviously, in that 12-CD set that we're also offering for a $300 pledge. But uh, really and truly... Uh, a radio pioneer, but a pioneer of thinking, was Alan Watts, an ambassador, I think is appropriately put, of uh, ways of thinking that uh, we were not uh, really uh, thinking about, if, if you will, uh, in America in the, in the time in which Alan was uh, bringing this to us and really uh, paving the way and uh, certainly ahead of his time and always timeless was Alan Watts. One eight hundred four three nine five seven three two five ten eight four eight five seven three two. You know, speaking of timeless, Jim, Alan Watts has all these critiques that we hear about society today. He talks about how when you make yourself an instant cup of coffee, you have, by deciding that you have no time, deprived yourself of a really good cup of joe. He talks about all these compromises we make because of illusory ideas of time and how much of it we have in space and how far we are from each other. But what he connects these critiques to is an actual spiritual and intellectual practice. And that's what you hear on this four CD set, which comes with a guided meditation session that Alan does for a pledge of $100 or more at 510-848-5732 or 1-800-439-5732. You see that synergy of analysis and practice, of critique and meditation. Someone trying to synthesize a completely original understanding of the world around us and how it works with an understanding of how we are to be in that world and how we are to participate it and on some level how we are to transcend it when we need to. If that's insight you could use in your life, we're very happy to offer you Alan Watts' voice on CD. We have the four CDs sent. Alan Watts, The Universe, Do You Do It or Does It Do You for a pledge of $100 or more or... You can get the 12 CD set for $300. That's the Alan Watts Out of Your Mind set for a $300 pledge at 1-800-439-5732 or 510-848-5732. And, of course, the most important thing you get when you pledge any amount is you get the continued vitality of KPFA, this radio station that was around 50-odd years ago to bring you the voice of Alan Watts, this radio station that's still around today to bring you hard-hitting news and analysis from around the world, to bring you people with new insights, uh, like Tim Wise critiquing racial discourse in contemporary, ostensibly race-blind America today, people like Pema Chodron, voices of insight and analysis, critique and inspiration that you get each and every day across the dial. When you pledge to KPFA, you make sure those voices still have a space on these airwaves, and you make sure that these airwaves are still a space for you and your neighbors here in northern and central California. That's what we're asking you to do. We're asking you to be part of the family that makes grassroots media possible and has been doing it for the past 59 years here at 94.1 FM, one 800 Four three nine five seven three two. You know, Alan Watts was not just a great talker. He was a liver of life, and he did live as he talked. He did practice, in essence, what he preached. And uh, this is uh, the the deep uh, uh, impact beyond the the sound of his voice, the great tone that he had, his humor, his pacing, etc. All of it was related to his beliefs and uh, his ability to communicate with others in such a powerful way that uh, had a home on KPFA. And uh, we're so grateful to have this to offer you today. If you do indeed become part of KPFA, we're asking you to go to your phones, give us a call at one 800 
439-5732-848-5732 in the 510 area code. We have four open lines. We'd love to fill them up with your help and support. And we'd also love to see some of you pledging online at kpfa.org this hour. But Katiana Giacona from Fairfax, thank you very much for your pledge of support. Yoni Waite from Inverness, thank you. Glinda Wilkerson from Corsco Gold, thank you. Sarah Harper from Emeryville, Jennifer Legg from Sausalito, and Mike Lawson from Santa Rosa. Those are all people who have uh, either renewed their pledge to KPFA or some of them are, in fact, new subscribers to KPFA, which is absolutely great to see. It's great to see all those names and uh, where they are calling from. So please uh, do continue to call one 800 Four three nine five seven three two eight four eight five seven three two in the five one zero area code. We have four uh, minutes left, and I think uh, that little piece of paper and the size of it that tells me we have a match. That that door you just heard opening and closing was Eaton Tosh from our subscriptions room coming in to tell us that Joan in Sebastopol has put a six hundred dollar challenge on the line. But Jim, we have just about four minutes to make it here. Uh, folks, you're familiar with challenges if you listen to our fun drive. If we can raise $600 in the next four minutes, we can keep it. If not, we have to offer it back to Joan in Sebastopol. So we're asking you if you've been out there and kind of holding back to come through for us in the next few minutes. We're going to need to fill about 10 phone lines to make sure we get there and make sure we've made good on Joan in Sebastopol's pledge. So $600 on the line. We need you to get on the phone and call 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732. It would be just two of you picking up the Allen Watts Out of Your Mind 12 CD set or just six of you getting the Allen Watts The Universe Do You Do It or Does It Do You 4 CD set or let me do the math here. It would be 24 people pledging at the KPFA basic membership rate of $25 for the year. But the most important thing is you pick up that phone, you make that contact, you help us get towards that match at 1-800-439-5732. Please give us a call. We do have five open lines, and uh, hopefully we'll fill them up with the five phone calls that we need, in addition to the person who is on there now, uh, in order to make this match, this challenge that's been offered to us by Joan in Sebastopol. So we're asking you to go to your phones and give us a call. There's another call right there. Uh, maybe you can afford to give us $8.33 a month, which would uh, in turn give you uh, the uh, knowledge that you're keeping KPFA on the air, and you'd also be able to get the four CD set, Alan Watts, Do You Do It or Does It Do You? So indeed, uh, do call right now and continue to keep KPFA on the path. 1-800-439-5732-848-5732 in the 510 area code. There's a couple more calls. I think we have at least one or two open lines. Looks like three lines open right now. Three minutes left here, and we're going to need at least three more phone calls. 1-800-439-5732. $25 a month gets you Alan Watts out of your mind, the 12-CD set. That's a $300 pledge. But uh, if you want to look at it of giving KPFA $25 a month, that would be a tremendous thing to do uh, here at KPFA. We'd love to have you uh, sign on for that and sign on for keeping KPFA an independent media outlet where you can hear voices Mm -hmm. like Alan Watts. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732. Folks, it's uh, $600 on the line here. Less than two minutes to go till we hand it off to cover to cover with Denny Smithson. And Joan Sebastopol has put up a $600 challenge. We're trying to get to that $600 mark so we can keep it. Looking at the phone calls that have come in so far, we must be getting close. We're asking for you to be the donation that puts us over the top. The pledge that's worth $600 to this grassroots radio station because you make good on that match. 1-800-439-5732 or 510-848-5732. Joan in Sebastopol put up $600 in a challenge to those of us listening to the radio right now. If we can match it with the sum total of our donations, we can keep it. But we can only do it if we all go there together. Pick up your phones. Give us a call. Let us know that the work we do here matters to you, and you're going to do your part as large or as small as you can afford to make sure we can keep the microphones on and the transmitter humming here at KPFA. 1-800-439-5732. For $100, we'll give you the Alan Watts 4-CD set. Do you do it or does it do you? How to let the universe meditate you. That's a 4-CD set that includes a rare guided meditation session with Alan Watts. We also have the 12-CD set, Out of Your Mind. Alan Watts is sent 
essential listen from the Alan Watts Audio Archives. That's for a pledge of $300 or more. And the most important thing you get, of course, is KPFA. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732. dollars on the line. 30 seconds to go. Still no thumbs up from the phone room. I consider this four CD set to be a living document because it does resonate so deeply with those who get a chance or an opportunity to hear it. I do suggest that if you can afford $100 to pledge to KPFA that you get that, you listen to it, you share it with friends, uh, you keep the message of Alan Watts going, you let other people hear it too, and if you value the resources that KPFA provides you, then pass it on. That's what we're asking you to do 